I've grown to really appreciate chanting more and more, especially over this past year. Just a way to um, invite the teachings into the heart. In a stealth kind of way. Like trickery, like I don't have to do anything. Just chant this, sweetie, and see what happens. And at times when it, it feels hard to Yeah, when life feels hard, it can feel really useful to set down all that additional striving energy and just remembering that the teachings of spiritual progression on this path really happens in its own time. Of course, we make efforts, of course we do. And our intentions and our efforts all matter. And we balance that with understanding that nature runs its own course. And we don't know, we don't know what we're gonna learn, when we're gonna learn it, how many times we need to revisit the same lessons. We don't even know how many lifetimes we've been around learning these lessons or how many more will return for more lessons. And so we can have both a some kind of spiritual urgency right? to know that life is important and we want to make the best of it. So allowing that kind of urgency to bring us home, home to the present moment home to our practice. And also to really balance that with this deeper understanding of karma, of rebirth. Like, oh, I, I really don't know how long this pattern is gonna be around. So I'm not gonna try to get rid of it. I'm not gonna somehow make a goal or a project out of practice, like a project to eradicate anxiety or Pretend like I'm a perfect, perfected heart. Like there's no doubt in this mind or no greedy tendencies or no hatred. Because that's just not the case. It's not the case for me. And I'm going to go out on a limb and say that it's probably not the case for any of us. We're all works in progress, right? And that doesn't mean like we have a pessimistic attitude about things. We, there's so much here, right? There's a lot of beauty, even in this last year, there's, it's been a difficult year, but it's really a limited view to describe 2020 as only a difficult year. There's so many, <clears throat> so many things. A, a parent, I was talking to a parent at a school I work at today and her child is, has been having a really difficult time and she was just remarking about how easy it is to have conversations about race and conversations about mental health and conversations about accommodations in school. And I was, yeah, it is easier right now. And it's easier in part because it's been, we've, we, we feel the urgency of the moment. It doesn't benefit us to sweep things under the rug or to pretend or to push it off till tomorrow. There's some kind of urgency that brings it forward for us right now. And so it's that urgency that reminds us that it's so important, it's really important to clarify our intentions, to take care of each other. To bring our mindfulness practice to our actions and our speech. 
to notice what we're setting in motion, what kind of karmic seeds we're setting in motion. And then we let it all go. And just surrender. I go, yeah, this is how it is right now. I really care about life. I care about the fragility of life. I care about our interconnectedness. I care about these cycles of samsara, pain and suffering that we're born into. I care about setting something in motion that feels beneficial for my life, for your life, for our life. And I understand that I'm not in charge, that I can only do my best to set something in motion with good intentions and surrender to the impact. I don't know what kind of impact that's going to have. It would be so nice if we could come to one loving kindness practice group every month and be full of compassion every day for the next month. Wouldn't that be nice? Yeah, I'd like that. Or if we promise to sit for 30 minutes every day, really mindful of the breath, if we could be guaranteed a stable, unwavering, equanimous mind throughout our day for the next month. But that's not the way it works. So we, we bring this attitude of surrender, like just really bowing to the conditions, to the force of habit in the mind, the force of habit that we're participating with, that we're setting in motion, knowingly, unknowingly, the force of delusion that sweeps us off our feet, leads us to do things that we later regret, or maybe we don't act on it, but but still, we feel it. So it's always this balance, this effort, good beneficial effort that we make and this surrender. So we're gonna make some good beneficial efforts and chanting and just invite the words into our heart. Invite them to really take root. Invite them to take root and plant seeds that are beneficial that will bear fruit and support us day by day, ongoing way. And we'll just surrender to whatever happens. Okay, <clears throat> I can't promise to carry a tune, but I'll do my best. There are these little inflection points. One kind of goes up to the left and down, and the other one goes the opposite direction. And the one that goes like this means you drop down in tone, and the one that goes like this means you go up in tone, okay? So down, up. Make sense? Okay. So other than that, it's just kind of a monotone chant. Yep, down, up. This is what should be done by one who is skilled in goodness. Like that. Okay, there's lots of ways to chant. So different versions, different inflections. So I just screwed that up. I said by one who is, I went up on skilled. So ignore that, I'll try to get it right. <laughs> it's just a different version of the same chant. Okay. <clears throat> Sometimes people put together their hands like this, you don't have to, but it's like a prayer position, we call this Anjali. And it, it really is just a way of honoring each other 
and in time, like we're doing this together. And I see that you're practicing and I see your sincerity. <clears throat> now let us chant the Buddha's words on loving kindness. This is what should be done by one who is skilled in goodness and who knows the path of peace. Let them be able and upright, straightforward and gentle in speech, humble and not conceited, contented and easily satisfied, unburdened with duties and frugal in their ways, peaceful and calm, and wise and skillful, not proud and demanding in nature. Let them not do the slightest thing that the wise would later reprove, wishing in gladness and in safety, may all beings be at ease. Whatever living beings there may be, whether they are weak or strong, omitting none, the great or the mighty, medium, short or small, the seen and the unseen, those living near and far away, those born and to be born, may all beings be at ease. Let none deceive another or despise any being in any state. Let none through anger or ill will wish harm upon another, even as a mother protects with her life, her child, her only child. So with a boundless heart, should one cherish all living beings, radiating kindness, over the entire world, spreading upwards to the skies and downwards to the depths, outwards and unbounded, freed from hatred and ill will, whether standing or walking, seated or lying down, Free from drowsiness, one should sustain this recollection. This is said to be the sublime abiding by not holding to fixed views. The pure hearted one having clarity of vision being freed from all sense desires, is not born again into this world. Let's find ourselves into a comfortable position now. Just connecting with the body. Mm -hmm. 
Allowing this to be our first noble move in practice. Just feeling Doesn't have to be a complicated move. Just simply knowing that there is this body and I can feel it. I know that I have a body to take care of. I can feel it right here. Already just connecting in this simple way is an act of love. This connection is already seated by an intention of some sort to be intimate. And although it may feel like metta or loving kindness is something that we have to work hard for, it's actually energy that's light and it is an accompaniment in every moment of mindfulness in every moment of awareness Metta can be expressed as non-hatred, non-ill will. Non-contention. See if you can feel that. The lightness or the warmth. The not pushing. energy of yes. Yes, I have a body. Yes, it feels valuable to know this, 
to know I have a body, to feel it. To remember that life flows through the body. Everything we need to know, we can learn right here with the body. The depth of wisdom is available right here with the body. The depth of love. You might feel the sensations in the hands. Or the face. Tingling or pulsating. Warmth or coolness. This heart's willingness to connect the ordinary way, the simple way to know the face, to know the hands, to not force them to be different. Remember that every sensation is here lawfully, naturally. No sense in demanding it be different. This knowing, this connecting, this is metta. This willingness of the heart to say yes. Yes, I feel this. That's metta.
And in your own way, just inviting the attention to move through the body. Feeling anything that's interesting. Playing with the effort a little, finding that balance, balance of pure acceptance, and remembering that we're doing something noble, important. by cultivating this habit of awareness. That light, content feeling that we sometimes get a glimpse of from time to time. As we're practicing connecting with the body, knowing the sensations, this is metta. Heart's willingness to say yes, not fighting anything, not trying to make the body feel more pleasant, that wholehearted yes to intimacy. This is Metta. So continue playing, exploring. Finding a balance in the effort. Remembering the possibility of light, content, moments of awareness, love, infused, mindfulness. And we'll continue in silence together for a little while longer.
and opening your eyes when you're ready. Thanks for your practice. If you'd like to take a moment to stand up even away from your computer just for a minute or two to stretch or get a drink of water, you're welcome to do that. We do so much sitting, it's nice for the body to move. Before I launch into some reflections, I'm curious how that meditation was for you. Any questions or reflections about the practice? Did you feel the warmth of metta? Nobody felt the warmth of metta. <laughs> well, I hope you felt the warmth of metta. This quote that I love, Shinzen Young is a pretty well-known teacher He's really taught quite extensively about uh, working with physical pain he says the ultimate expression of meditation comes when we can feel all the pains of the world experience them with mindfulness and equanimity so they dissolve into energy and then recolor that energy and radiate, radiate it out as unconditional love, moment by moment, through every pore of our being. Read that one more time. The ultimate expression of meditation comes when we can feel all the pains of the world, experience them with mindfulness and equanimity, so they dissolve into energy and then recolor that energy and radiate it out as unconditional love, moment by moment, through every pore of our being. I almost don't need to say anything more. Really is a beautiful expression of embodiment. not being afraid to use our practice to, to bring our practice right in the middle of life, to not be afraid of the pains of the world, pains of the heart, the pains in our lives, and to feel it, to feel how it moves, to touch it. And when we say feel it, we really mean like right here in our body. Because every mind state, every emotional pain, in addition to all the physical, it all has a felt sense, this mind, 
this heart body connection. It's always here. You can sometimes develop this habit of living in a more intellectual world, walking around as yeah, disconnected from our body and what it feels. But our whole life moves right here through the body. So in part through meditation practice, through mindfulness practice, we learn how to re-inhabit our bodies. And it's not an easy process. We have all kinds of reasons for disconnecting. There's lots of pain, not just physical pain, but emotional pain. And when we learn to feel it, we become more capable, more courageous, but it's a process. There are these ingrained habits that are, have been established for a long time for many of us around disconnection, like this part of the body's off limits or the body's off limits under these circumstances, because there's so much to feel and it can feel overwhelming or we actually anticipate it being overwhelming. But part of that re-inhabiting our bodies is learning that we're actually more courageous and capable than we think. And when we can feel what's moving in our bodies, then we can learn to be in the middle of anything because we, we're not afraid. Like, oh, this emotional pain, this problem. I've been feeling a bit in moments some despair about all of the voter suppression laws that are, they have so much energy behind them, state by state. It, it's a painful to watch this happen. And the idea of this is going to be, this is overwhelming is an idea, but actually the truth in this moment is much different. This heart, this body is, there's a, an energy that's available and an energy that allows for my participation, my skillful participation, just like yours, our skillful participation. We choose how we want to use our bodies in this lifetime how we used to want to use our voices. And this is what Shenzhen was pointing to. When we can, the ultimate expression of meditation comes when we can feel, when we can feel the pains of the world, not just the pains, but the joys. In this case, he's pointing to pains. We can feel the pains of the world, experience them with mindfulness and equanimity, the stability of a mountain that isn't swayed by the winds. So our practice, our willingness to be here, to feel the warmth or the coolness, the tingling, the pressure in the body in a single moment is the preparation we need for feeling all the things. Learn how to experience the pains of the world with mindfulness right here, intimacy and equanimity, some stability, oh, I can do this, I'm feeling it, yep. And you might have noticed in the meditation that that just happens naturally. One moment of, moment of mindfulness conditions the next. And then two or three minutes down the road and we're still with the practice. Like, oh, we're still feeling the body. That's how this works. Practice is a training. We become more capable of living a mindful life in many moments, not just one, one breath. We can feel all the pains of the world, experience them with mindfulness and equanimity and not cling so that they dissolve into energy. So these moments when we don't, aren't fighting life, we're not contending with something, we're not demanding things be different. It's not that we don't want things to be different. It's okay to care 
to want to participate skillfully for some benefit for the good of our lives or the good of ourselves and each other, our families and the world. It's beautiful to have intentions of well being. And we just had some intentions of well being at the beginning of that meditation when we were chanting. And so this dissolving into energy, experiencing them with mindfulness and equanimity so they dissolve into energy. Oh, this is just a human form that has some possibility of participating skillfully, not clinging to any of it, not clinging to any of the emotions that flow through this heart, the pain of the heart, so that this heart is free to participate as it wants, right? so that we're free to use our minds and our bodies for our skillful benefit. And so to experience all the pains of the world with mindfulness and equanimity, so they dissolve into energy, energy that can be used, energy that can be of benefit. And then remembering the lightness that's there, remembering the warmth that's there, how good it feels to not cling how good it feels to participate. It feels so good. It really does feel good to have this intention to use my life for the benefit of all beings. It actually makes me happy just to remember like, oh, I've cared about that today. I've had a really busy day, but I've really cared about using my life, my life energy well. How nice is that? to reinvest in mindfulness and care moment by moment. It's not that I made every right decision or my mind was perfectly clear, stable and balanced without any aversion. It wasn't like that. I had a normal, ordinary day as, as an ordinary human being. And I was a mixed bag. But in so many moments today, I remembered Oh, of this possibility of awareness and this possibility of not contending with life. And it felt good. Oh, it feels good to just use the energy of this body and mind well. To have this conversation, to invite anything to come forward. Mm -hmm. And to do that again and again and again. The ultimate expression of meditation comes when we can feel all the pains of the world, experience them with mindfulness and equanimity, so they dissolve into energy, and then recolor that energy and radiate it out as unconditional love, moment by moment through every pore of our being. Mm -hmm. That recolor that energy is remembering that metta is already here. In moments when we're not contending, we're not fighting, not clinging, metta is already here. And then radiate it out as unconditional love, moment by moment, through every pore of our being. Just using our energies well, being a force making our lives, being a force of good. Remembering that if colleagues around us are talking bad about someone, then we're not going to jump in. We're going to be a force of good. It's simple moments like this. Remembering that to, my dog needs a walk and not to just get absorbed into emails for too long and forget to take her out or not care about her needs. Through every pore of my being, moment by moment, unconditional love, taking care of that which we can take care of. And we do this in so many ways, don't we? We use our lives well in so many ways. It's good to remember that. Sometimes it feels like, I've, I've said this already once tonight, probably, 
say it a lot. It's been a really important teacher just to remember that practice isn't about getting it right. It's a purification, a transformation. A process of purification often does, the process isn't a single moment in time. Something that we do for a long time. It's a renewed intention. That we can renew this intention to live in a decent way. To bring mindfulness with us. And every time we're doing that and remembering that this is what we're doing, we are planting seeds of metta. We're planting seeds of loving kindness. If every being remembered five times a day to plant seeds of kindness in whatever ways we could, it would be radically transformative. And then add the extra layer of knowing that that's what we're doing. So if we all made a commitment for the next week, five times every day, to plant seeds of kindness and to be mindful of that. We would feel good about the way we lived, at least in those, those five moments every day. Because there's no doubt that kindness is beneficial, right? And then to reflect on our own goodness, to know our own goodness, not even to reflect on it, but in that moment to know our own goodness. Oh, this heart is capable of kindness. Just remembering how good it feels to reflect on our own goodness and how at times we can feel like there's so much to learn. We got to remember all the things and go to all the workshops and it becomes like a task that we have to do. Our spiritual practice becomes another task that we have to do. And it's not like, you know, there's there's so much benefit in caring deeply and wanting to go on retreat and study and listen and know the teachings, for example. And it's also good, like I said in the beginning, to drop all that striving and just remember. Remember the possibility that's right here in this moment, like, oh, the possibility of kindness, just in a moment of mindfulness. So beautiful, our project, our practice doesn't have to be a project. Another task list that we check off, if we've got it right, if we're good enough. But it's simple and possible, and perhaps just takes a slight reorienting like Oh, kindness is already here. Look at that. This heart knows how to be good. I mean, does everybody brush their teeth in the morning? Raise your hand if you brush your teeth in the morning. <laughs> Irma, did you say, I hope so? <laughs> right, I hope so. Does everybody brush their teeth? Does Like, that's a good thing to do for your body, right? Taking care of your body. It's a little bit of kindness. Now, how many of us remember when we're brushing our teeth, that we're being kind. Hardly, right? Or do we think of brushing our teeth as like one thing we have to do as part of our morning routine? It's just a job. Yeah. And how many other opportunities are there to remember that we're actually being kind when we do things that we orient to as jobs? so many of those moments. Well, it's just to illustrate that it's just a mindfulness practice, our meditation practice can just be a slight move, like attitude adjustment, right? 
from seeing our lives as one giant task list to remembering that there are so many moments where the heart knows how to be good and we're just going to look out for them because they're here and they're available and it feels good to remember our own goodness not only does it feel good but it it um makes it possible for kindness to emerge again because every time that a beneficial mind state is noted or noticed, it strengthens it. So if we want to cultivate loving kindness, if we want to cultivate metta, our job is to notice it because it gets stronger. And one moment of mindfulness or one moment of metta then conditions the next. It's the law of nature. The Buddha laid this out so many ways in the teachings. In fact, there's this list called the five spiritual faculties. And this is how s spiritual progress is made. The Buddha, this is the one of the lists that the Buddha talked about how spiritual progress is made. It begins with a bit of confidence, a bit of faith. It doesn't have to be a lot, just a dose of faith. Maybe there's some benefit to being kind. Let me check it out. And then we practice. Well, let me just see if Shelly was crazy when they said to notice I'm being kind when I'm brushing my teeth. So you just do this little experiment. This is perhaps a, just a bit of faith in your mind that it might be possible. Not a lot, but just a little. So the next time you brush your teeth, you just remember, like, am I being good to my body? And you go, oh yeah, I'm being good to my body. Well that moment then conditions the next and we want to make a little bit of effort to pick up kindness and to set down ill will so this is so spiritual progress begins with faith and then because there's a little bit of faith we make a little bit of effort some there's some energy that's there and when there's a little bit of effort there like to try just to try a little bit, like I'm going to check this thing out, being kind while brushing my teeth. And then already, because of the effort that we make to be mindful, which is the third faculty, then that seeds the next moment of mindfulness. This is the law of nature, and then we become more continuous with our practice. And in the case of kindness, we feel into our own goodness and we recognize that it feels good to know we're being kind, to be mindful of our kindness. And then we want to keep doing that. So we notice it in more and more ways. Like, oh, this is me being kind. That's so ordinary. It's hardly even, you know, sometimes my mind will go like, well, it's so ordinary. Can I really even call this kindness? But it feels good. So I know it's beneficial. Like to catch myself feeding my dog. Like, oh, I really care that you're nourished and you're eating good food. Let me just watch you gobble it up. It feels good. And that I had a part in that, right? So that just allows the next moment. So faith seeds effort. Effort seeds mindfulness. Mindfulness seeds samadhi. And samadhi seeds wisdom. Those five. Faith effort, mindfulness, mindfulness becomes continuous, we call that samadhi or concentration, and then because this mind is stable, it becomes to see more and more deeply into the way things really are, and that's what we call wisdom. We start to know the truth. We start to feel into the truth in deeper and deeper ways. We start to grow in our capacity and courage. And this is what we call wisdom. Like, oh, really seeing. Seeing the way human nature is. Seeing all the tendencies of mind to be unkind. To negate my own goodness. To tell myself stories all day long about how I'm not good enough. Not good enough, not good enough. Didn't do that right.
And to be willing to accept those pains of the world, what Shenzhen Yun called the pains of the world, those are pains of the world. My own self-deprecating nature, that's a pain. And to fully accept that, meet it with mindfulness and care, right there in that moment. And realize that what I'm doing is tran already transformative. Already, right there, that willingness to meet it, right there is already transformative. And because we can see more deeply into the possibility of meeting life in all of its depth and breadth, right, that we don't have to only put on our rose-colored glasses and notice what's kind and good, but we can also accept the pains, like the non-kindness, and meet that with kindness. Like, oh, a uh, yes. Because it's not like an effusive love. Metta is not like an effusive love. It's this light warmth, this light yes. That's it, just very gentle. Right? It's not saying no. It's not... It's not doing more hatred. It's not doing more violence. And it's a beautiful question to ask how far reaching, what are the limits of love? The Buddha called metta boundless. Like it has no end. So thinking of all the ways that we rely on ill will or hatred or anger or rage to fuel our actions with a little question, like, is that the only way? It doesn't mean that we accept or like the ways of the world. It doesn't mean that we accept police brutality, for example, or voter suppression laws. It doesn't mean that we just passively lie down and go, okay, this is just the way it is. That's not the teachings. But it's like remembering that this possibility, the boundness, the, to have a question in mind about the boundless possibility of love. Can love fuel even the most intense, inspired, engaged, persistent, response from every through every pore of my being you know, that quote just really gets me through every pore of my being through my hands my mouth my legs my arms my fingers when I'm typing every pore of my being boundless quality of love. Is there any other way? Such a wonderful question. Right now this heart is really committed. You know, in these moments that it feels like the heart is doubling down on ill will as the only strategy, as the only way out of this mess. Is there any other way? It just undermines it a bit. And then we wonder about the boundless quality of love the boundless quality of metta. And if it's really possible to open to the pain of this, because right? that's really where we get to feel the possibility of metta. When we feel the pain that's moving, because that heart that wants to constrict that the heart of rage and anger and ill will is the heart that is constricted. It's very, it's tight and small. But love is boundless. It's not weak, it's strong. And so is there any other way in this moment when the heart is so impinged? Is there any other way, is there a way to be bigger than this? Expansive and creative and not lose the force of energy that's there, but to 
allow that energy to move and radiate it out through our words and actions. And this is where practice gets to be a big playground because we can explore this. The Buddha did that. The Buddha was radical. He did all kinds of wild things. Walking around, experimenting, not eating, all kinds of stuff. And he learned by trial and error, right? The Buddha, the Buddha also taught directly. The Buddha also, he was teaching, he was speaking truth to power. So we don't want to forget that in terms of practice as action. The Buddha was denouncing caste, and you can hear this in his language. He was speaking right into, he was speaking directly to anti-oppression again and again when he was teaching. So this is what we're doing. We're a force of love, like wondering if there's any other way through every pore of our being, following in the Buddha's footsteps. I think I'll stop there. Save a few few minutes for reflections of your own. Thank you for listening. What do you have to say? Yeah, Irma. Finding ways for energy to move and not get stuck and make you sick. Yeah. And this is, you know, Resma calls this clean pain. I don't know if you've gotten to that part yet, but Resma makes this distinction between clean pain and dirty pain. And dirty pain is like we might think about it as the pain of reactivity that gets stuck and then comes out sideways with white supremacy, with passivity, with rage. It's dirty pain. It's the pain of blame. It's a pain of non-mindfulness. But with mindfulness practice, we, we don't have to be afraid of anything. We learn how to not be afraid. Not by forcing the heart not to be afraid, but by metabolizing pain again and again and again. The pain of boredom, the mundane, right? The pain, pain of small irritations, the pain of minor sadnesses until we get more and more capable of metabolizing pain then it just doesn't stick anymore it just flows through doesn't mean that we don't care that our heart doesn't break but it's like as that metabolizing process compassion needs pain it necessitates pain right compassion is the heart that cares about suffering so that ability to meet pain with love, that's the metabolizing process. The pain, the, that like heart that goes, oh yeah, this can move. It doesn't have to be stuck. And even in those moments when you see a lot of white people being passive and not asking questions, not doing, say it's not doing our work, to feel the pain of that too. Like, oh yeah, this is this is how white supremacy is born, right here, like this. Yeah. Until it just really invite that to move. Let it move. And we each have that responsibility to let it move in its in a way that feels right for us. Right? Let but to invite the movement of energy so that it dissolves. and can be radiated out through every pore of our being. What a beautiful transformative thing. Victory Boyd. Yeah. What if we learn to cultivate the 
boundless quality of metta so that it flowed through our pores and we were, saw each other as sailing right behind each other for all the moments. We would become as courageous as Darnella Frazier. Right? All right. Final thoughts? Thanks, everyone.